All right, and it tells me that. Okay. Hi, welcome yeah. to this Open Security Summit session in January 2022. And we are actually gonna have a really, I would say very interesting session where we are actually gonna talk about, well, Brooke is gonna talk about tech leadership, which is one of those skills that applies of course to every type of professional, but if you're in a security sphere, a lot of your job is about leadership. A lot of your job is influencing, communicating upwards, communicating downwards, and making sure that the vision that you have is executed. So Brooke is gonna to talk to us about exactly that, how you manage and how you lead in technology world. Over to you, Brooke. All right, thank you very much, Denise. Um, so I, I just wanna say, um, I really want folks to participate because we all have ideas about leadership and we've all experienced them. So please, you know, in the chat or, or feel free to unmute yourself and, and come in, let's have a discussion. I wanted to throw this up, not, not because I want you to be impressed or anything like that. You know, I've had a bunch of tech leader roles. That doesn't mean I was any good at them. And I have made major mistakes, which I hope to uncover in this, in this uh, talk. Um, so we all understand better, but the thing is, a CV is not leadership. My credentials to sit here and talk to you are not leadership. And I wanted to make that point right up at the front. Yeah, look at this. I've written a bunch of books. Um, I, I do talks like this on a regular basis. Supposedly people listen to what I have to say. I, I often write posts and things. Those acts might be leadership, but the CV, the credentials by themselves are not. And I just wanted to point that out. So don't get too lost in all this stuff. I, as I said, <laughs> um, I have tried to be a technical leader and I even had reports. I've even had reports. Yes, I have. It's a good experience, even if you want to be a tech leader, by the way. Um, oh, can your reports rip you to pieces? Yes, they can. Um, so uh, please, I would love it if you would, if we could in some way share some of our experiences of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and so I'd like to open that up. If, if we don't get any volunteers, that's okay. I have lots of material here, but I would love it if we could all contribute and pour in. We've all experienced leadership. So anybody wanna, wanna jump in here? And I'll try to watch the chat as well. Oops, sorry. Somewhere, it's a chat. Um, anybody want to jump in? So, what was the exact is the question? Just to yeah, just 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 random experiences of good leadership, bad leadership, and really ugly leadership you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly, anything, personal experience, short, of course, but um, we, we've all, we, we, we all have leaders at our jobs and everywhere else in our lives. What what's, was notable? And, and don't be afraid to say the really horrible things. <laughs> I think, you know, it's useful. If not, I have, I have a pretty good story to uh, throw in Brooke, here. Brooke, uh, this, is, this, is, this is Chari. I um, for me, um, when, every time that we go on talking about this leadership, tech leadership, <clears throat> uh, the first thing that comes to mind is leading by example. I think is one of the things, especially in the society that we live now, in the world that we live now, leading by example means a lot nowadays. So that is one thing that I always keep on the back of my mind because when I want to implement, I want to share a vision or a mission, I want to make sure that I'm the first supporter. And the other, the other um, thing that I wanted to, so that was one idea and is um, the importance. I think uh, uh, Denise in his intro words said, you know, uh, leadership is communicating upwards and downwards. And that is the other, thing that comes to me right away when we talk about leadership. You communicate to executives, to C-level investors, advisors, but also you uh, communicate down with the rest of your team. And that is, I think, two aspects very important when it comes to leadership. Thank you. Anyone else want to jump in here? Let's just have a couple.
If not, I will, uh, but you can interrupt me. Um, I'm going to tell a story about a, oh, Luis, go on, hit it. Can Luis come off mute? Unmute. Okay, sorry, I finally can unmute myself. Thank you very much. Uh, good leadership, in my in my experience, sets goals and gives you freedom to achieve them, however you see fit. Uh, it's not telling you how to get there, but it's more telling you the why. So why you have to do something. And, and uh, that generates motivation, allows for ownership, allows for, for growing in the role and doing things. Bad leadership tries to give you the what and, and tries to tell you exactly what to do, when to do it, what not to do, and limits all your freedom, all your chances of growing because that person is the expert, that person is the, the leader. Bad leadership, ugly leadership, promotes minimis, carbon copies of him or herself. So if the leader has an expertise in incident response, promotions will be in the incident response team, neglecting everyone else in the, in the bigger community, for example. So th those could be my, go my good, bad, and ugly. Thank you. And it's really lovely to hear your voice, Luis. So, um, I'm going to tell a little story, and this is, to me, a whole bunch of things, and it kind of underlines a couple of things we said, certainly. And it's a real story. Every story I'm going to tell you is absolutely happened, as far as I know. You know, no. A friend of mine at a very, very large tech company with hundreds of thousands of employees looked at me and said, "I'm Brooke, is there anything you can do? because my manager looked at me and said, I'm giving the one promotion I have to my friend, sorry. I can almost hear the snare drop, frump, on that one. I'm giving the promotion to my friend, sorry. Too bad for you. Yeah. Pretty ugly. I'll just let that sit and let's move on. Uh, I don't have this queued up. I'm gonna say a few things that leadership is not. It's not a title. Although your title may require leadership, they may be expecting it of you or me or anyone, but a title is not leadership. And a position in a hierarchy, you know, I've become a director now or I've become a vice president. That's not leadership, though it may require it of you. And people reporting to you is not leadership just because they report to you. But in my experience, I have seen people mistake these things for leadership and believe that they were now leaders. But these do not a leader make, in my opinion. Um, again, you might have to provide some leadership in each of these, but that's a different thing. And leadership is not expensive apparel. I will tell you a story, as I love stories. Anyone who knows me knows that. And that is, um, at one time, I was invited into the boardroom as the most senior security architect. Uh, I was invited to the weekly meetings of the board, of not the board, but all the senior execs. And I walked in to this company and these execs had been wearing their most expensive clothes. I mean, the shoes must have been, that must have been a, a whole fortune right there in that room. And it was clear because I, I, I didn't know I was being invited. My, my boss said, you're coming into this meeting. We need you. And, and I was in my bicycle clothes. So uh, interestingly, we got a new CEO. And that CEO, she's an out lesbian with a long, fabulous career. She brought her dogs in. She was wearing her jeans. She didn't care what anyone was wearing. And it was really interesting to watch what happened. Because over time, these folks 
started, some of them were more comfortable in the clothes they wore, and that's fine. You can wear whatever you want. I'm, I'm not saying you shouldn't wear lovely clothes. That's not my point. But I'm saying that they were doing it clearly for a reason, because some of them, as they got permission to still be leaders, they began to dress differently over time. And that, that, um, that CEO's um, tenure was actually quite short, I think about nine months. She went on to another thing she want, really wanted to do. Um, but nevertheless, um, she shifted what happened in that room a lot just by modeling to um, uh, Sherry's point. And it's interesting um, how, how that can happen. Now, I will tell you my trick. Because I wasn't going to wear really expensive clothes in there, I used to dress like the janitor. I'd come in in my absolute riding my bicycle to work clothes. Really, really not very nice. Certainly covering me and clean, absolutely. But nice clothes. Shirts I got from speaking at conferences and stuff like that. Just really, you know, not my best jeans, nothing. You know, trainers, because it was more comfortable riding a bike. And I would sit on the floor. There were no chairs, so I would sit on the floor. And I kind of did this sort of opposite piece because then they had to figure out why I was in that room. And so they paid attention to me when I opened my mouth. And they listened to what I had to say for, you know, for those first few times because they tried to figure out, okay, why is this person in this room? And what is the, what is the, what is the purpose of this? Then, of course, once they got comfortable with me, I didn't have to play these games anymore. But I kind of went the opposite way in order to say, look, I'm not going to play the game. I either provide value here or I don't. And you're going to have to pay attention in order to figure that out. Um, so just a little interesting story, perhaps, of some how I may work things. Now, in order to do that, you got to be really confident. And I've been in the lucky position for a long time that if somebody doesn't like me and they want to fire me, I can go find another job really fast. So, you know, I, 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 I have the wonderful um, position, luxury is the right word, to allow myself to try different things and see if they'll work, which you don't always have. So let's be clear about that. Um, leadership is not talking more. We had a fella who was a leader by role, um, and he was the most senior, absolutely the highest level security architect, and nobody could speak, but he would answer them in every meeting. He spoke between every person. So it was like you were always having a dialogue with this person, as opposed to having a discussion with everybody in the room. That's not leadership. Not only that, also is the next thing, occupying the most space or energy is not leadership. You might have to occupy space to demonstrate leadership. You certainly will have to open your mouth, I think, if you have something to say. But leadership is not being the one who talks most or has all the right answers or takes up the most space or energy. And it certainly is not making decisions, although as a leader, you may be in the position to make decisions. Certainly, that is true. Um, I'll tell you, if I, in my leadership roles, I always felt it was a failure of me to have to tell someone what to do. I always felt it was a failure. And if I did that twice in a year, I started looking in the mirror and thinking, what am I doing wrong? How am I, how am I, what's, what's, what's wrong here? Why, why is this occurring? Now, obviously there are people out there who won't do anything unless you tell them what to do. <laughs> and that's a management problem and you have to deal with that. But nevertheless, if you're working, as Luis said, with people who are empowered and, and there to mostly to do the work, you really shouldn't have to tell people what to do um, ever. And I always considered it a failure of my leadership when I had to look at someone and they say, I think that's your job. That's, that shouldn't happen, at least not very often. 
So um, we, we already did this. Folks poured into this. So I'm going to skip over this brainstorm and move on. Unless somebody wants to say something right at this moment, I'll give a little space. If somebody wants to comment at this point, please do. Well, here's the truth of it. Really think down in your deep soul, in your deep mind, however you conceive of these things. Can anyone actually ever tell you what to do? Just say, go do this thing. I mean, without coercion, without some, you know, need on your part. Can anyone really tell you? And, and we as animals, animals don't take to being told what to do very well. They really don't. Um, it takes years to get a puppy to decide as a dog, oh, geez, I want to be with you. So I'll come when you say that magic word, when you say my name and that magic word, because we're buddies and, and I want to be next to you. Um, you, you, can, you, can, you can scream at it all you want and it will just run away. Um, that's our natural, innate uh, reaction. We do things because of pleasure, meeting our needs, because we want connection as social animals. Yes, we do those things. We do it because we want to do. And this is very important to me as a leader, is that I'm not going to make people do things if I can possibly avoid it. because they won't do a good job for one thing. They'll do the absolute minimum or they'll do, you know, shoddy work. And I don't want shoddy work. Um, yeah. Animal basics. This is one of our, our absolute deep basics that I hold all the time. So that brings me to a really important point. And I know people talk about about know thyself, and that's part of a lot of, of spiritual and philosophical practices. We don't have time to de jump into that. If that's part of your spiritual or philosophical practice, great. Um, I've spent a lot of time on my thinking about my reasons for doing things and, and, and you know, what, what, how, well, how I behave and how I don't behave well. Um, I have spent a lot of time at that, and I bring a lot of that work, which is outside this, um, to this work, but I'm not pushing anything. Um, I want to be really clear about that. Still, it's important for us because nobody can make us do something we don't want to do without coercion, that we realize what we're getting out of being a leader. Really important. If you take up the mantle you're probably going to be getting something out of it. Even if it's just the confirmation of a personal story you have that you're a leader material or something. I mean, you know, people do that. I'm not saying anything about anybody on this call. Um, that's not my point. But it, it may be, you know, that could be one of the things. Um, I get a huge amount of satisfaction when I've shared something and it has helped someone. I just get the biggest flood of oxytocin imaginable. I feel so great. That's one of the things I get out of doing this work. I get incredible um, pleasure out of watching a team come together and start to move mountains together. And if I could have facilitated a little of that and helped in that process, I really get a lot of delight out of it. And I, I want to be really clear because I don't think there's anything that's really altruistic. We're altruistic because we're getting something out of it. I'm not saying that's bad. Uh, maybe in some philosoph philosophies it is, but in my world it's not. But it's important that we know what we're getting. And if we're using leadership to be a bulwark against our self-esteem problems, that will come up and it will get in the way. So it's good to do a little of that thinking, I think, and a little of that reflection. What am I getting out of this? And why am I doing this? 
and you know what's the good about it and what's the bad. It may be time to tell the time I had reports and I had two people who invested me in organizational um, organizational power over them. Now that's not the way I tried to be as a um, as the director of software development for this software house. But I, I really tried to be something different. But they wanted that. They expected that. So an interesting story. One day, a junior programmer who was really just growing into her, her work, um, and I was trying to help her take on ever more, you know, interesting and, and, and learning experiences. One day, she offered me a banana but I don't like commercial bananas because they've been gassed and that smell really is off-putting to me. So I said, no, I don't eat commercial bananas. I only eat organic bananas. Thank you very much. When it was time for evaluation of my leadership, what my boss got back was that I stood in the kitchen and told this woman that she should never eat any bananas. What I learned from this situation was I was being too giant. My boundaries weren't good enough. She had invested me with powers to tell her whether she should eat bananas or not. Not that I actually did. I certainly didn't because, you know, they said, you got to go talk to her and figure this out. And I sat down with her and I said, did I actually say you couldn't eat bananas? I think what I said is I only eat organic bananas. Thank you very much. And she looked at me and she thought for a moment. And she said, yes, that's right. That's what you said. But in her mind, because of the organizational hierarchy, she invested with me with the power to tell her whether she should eat bananas or not. This is a true story. Um, it was a very hard lesson for me because I work on connection a lot. That's my particular way of working this. But when you have reports, you have to have better boundaries than that. You're not going to have connection with everyone. And some people are going to invest you with powers you do not want. And you have to be aware of that. It was a very hard lesson and it hurt a lot, but it was a good lesson. Um, yeah, that's the organizational piece of this. Okay, um, moving on. And this is really important. The only kind of authority you really have, any of us really has is earned, which goes back to was it um, Sherry who said, you got a model? I think so. You got, to, you got to show your value. And so the first thing I do when I get a new one of these roles is I go in and start doing the, the work that I'm going to ask my security architects to do. I start modeling that work and developing value and start solving problems and, and showing it. A, I'm not above the work. It isn't, doesn't work that way. But B, I'm looking for earned authority and I don't get it from my CV. Yeah, I get some from my CV by now. But still, um, when I'm on a job, it's about demonstrating value and plus which I'm helping people solve their problems. And so I start to build trust with the people I'm working with. Um, but I'm also modeling for the people that I will want to help build my team. I'm modeling for them what I expect and, and how I want to behave. And so I develop, I start earning my authority because that's the only way. This comes from a guy named Dr. Arnold Mindell. And I recommend anyone who's interested in how groups work to read his book, Sitting in the Fire. It changed the way I viewed work groups tremendously um, because I mean, there's a lot more in there besides earned authority, but it's really important to understand that um, that you don't have any authority except what you earn for real. And when you earn it, when you demonstrate value, when you help, then people start to respect you and trust you and they will follow you. And what's interesting is the other side of that is when people see something starting to change and move. Everyone who wants to see some things change and want to see something move, start jumping in. It's really attractive. 
seeing things move and seeing stuff start to get done. It's really attractive, not to everyone, but to lots of people. And it'll bring the right people to you. Um, this has happened to me many times now, and I'm convinced it works. Um, I go in and I'm there. Really, the enthusiasm I bring to the work. Um, I, but effectiveness, too. It can't just be enthusiasm. You have to earn your authority. You have to deliver value. You have to, you know, be able to do things um, and, and show that you that you can produce. And that starts to get a ball rolling that's very attractive and brings me people who want to join in and who want to contribute. And then, you know, it kind of spirals or, or goes viral, as they say today. But you have to start with earned authority. And, and I recommend, highly recommend Dr. Arnold Mendel's book, Sitting in the Fire, about groups, um, because there's a lot more about norms and about uh, about how to effectively, effectively be a leader in there. There's a lot in there about how you almost always have someone who will make trouble and they're not troublemakers. Well, sometimes they are. Sometimes it's their personal stuff and you guys just got to deal with that. But a lot of times it's just that the norms are keeping some of the information out of the field and you want to open to that information. There's a lot in there about that. Um, I'm not going to go into now because this isn't about work groups. It's about leadership. But I, I highly recommend his book, Sitting in the Fire. Um, so leadership emerges, I believe, through taking responsibility, through effective action. Merely caring is not going to be sufficient. You got to do something. And it's okay to make mistakes. I have made a lot of awful mistakes in my career, a lot of really dreadful ones. And I'm just happy and, and honored that people will lift, help me lift me up when I've made these. Um, so, you know, it's not about being perfect. It's about effective action and doing the best you can. Um, it's about seeing the strategic even in the tactical. People will recognize that. They'll get a sense that you're going someplace and you have someplace to go and you're not just moving stuff from the in bin to the out bin. If you're going to move stuff from the in bin to the out bin, that's not probably going to be seen as leadership. But if you think about how certain things there are really important because they're strategic and you understand that and you move those forward with an intent, Lots of people will figure that out, that you're thinking strategically. And finally, and Denise did it uh, before we started recording today, you got to care to share that passion that says, hey, there's this better way I know of doing this. Have you tried using Wardley maps for a threat model? It's really fantastic. And it works like this. That passion is very attractive. It will put some people off, by the way. Um, and that's just, you know, maybe it's my style or aesthetic or whatever, but it will. But that passion is, is very powerful. Um, it's time to tell another story, I think, about my first big leadership test. And this is before I got into my high tech career is during my master's degree um, when I had no intention of going into high tech. Um, I was really focused on uh, my mother's um, clothing business and uh, being a musician. I had just come off a few years before, just come off the road with Bo Diddley and, and it you know kind of fell apart. And so I was trying to figure out my way of how I was going to be a musician further on in my life because that's what I was, it's one of my passions. Um, and so I'm, I'm in this master's class and we have work groups and I had a string of straight A's going and I wasn't going to let that go. I think I was 29, uh, 25. So let's, this is a long time ago. Um, I was 25 years old, just desperate to do the very, very best and to get straight A's if I could possibly manage it. And I did get one B in that master's. Um, it's, not worth talking about, but I did get almost straight A's, Gra graduated at the top of my class. So I was really, really driven. 
And I got into a team, maybe intentionally composed, with a couple of folks who were happy with C's. So I didn't let them roll anything and our work group got an A. I made sure that the work was at A level. Everything I possibly could, I ensured that we got an A in that class, everybody. And then came time for the, and how did the group go? And those people, my teammates, ripped me up and down, sideways, top, bottom, as a controlling, dreadful human being they never wanted to have anything more to do with ever. It was extraordinarily painful, extraordinarily. Clearly, I was a rotten leader. So when I say I've made mistakes, I'm not kidding. I have made lots of mistakes. And that was a very, very painful thing. And when I started to get tech leadership positions, I was determined not to do that, at least, uh, and not to put myself in the way of that. Um, certainly, people have been through my teams that haven't liked me very much or didn't enjoy working with me. Um, that does happen. There's nothing I can do about it. Uh, I'm still going to keep doing what I do. But that very first time of a serious leadership or possibility for leadership, I didn't have to take leadership. I just took it without any consent from anybody else because I wasn't going to get a grade less than A. Um, and, you know, predictably it went where it went. Um, I don't know if that was the intention of the person who put us together uh, or not. Um, I never talked to him about it, the professor, but he was very sharp, so it could have been. Um, anyway, uh, it's important that you don't do that <laughs> and that we don't come in, you know, thinking I'm going to make sure everybody performs the way I think they should and to my standards and my way of doing things, because I can assure you that does not go well. Anybody want to say anything? Can I bring Sung Lee? Uh, you, had, you made a good comment. If you can mute yourself, do you want to yeah. talk about that? Yeah, I was looking at the leadership um, qualities here, and I think I really struggle with care to share. And I think there's a multiple reason why that's happening, but one of the big thing that's driving not wanting to share is my background, cultural background, where I was raised, I was not supposed to talk about my accomplishments or what I know and et cetera, because that could be considered kind of boastful, right? So how do I, how do I balance this out? I mean, this is the struggle. And, and to add that, um, I think um, personality-wise, I'm extreme introvert. I like to keep things to myself and I don't want to like really interact with a lot of people. So, you know, how do I balance all of this? That's my struggle. Well, and we each have our, you know, again, that's going back, what am I getting out of this? I think a leader doesn't have to do all of these. Now I'm gonna eventually end up at the Intel distinguished engineer, principal engineer qualities. Cause I think that, you know, that fairly well maps to what a leader does. And, you know, you know very well <laughs> that one of those is mentorship, right? But there's a lot of different ways to do that. You know, I mean, uh, you can be a big personality and you can stand up on stage and, and yell about it, or you can just notice that somebody's struggling or when they ask you a question, give them a really good answer. They're both equally valuable. And I think I would, I would wanna make sure, and I'm sorry if I let everyone down the, down any kind of path that said you have to be a big personality in order to share. Um, I don't think so. Um, I, I know that, you know, as an introvert, I will say that I know you personally, and I've worked with you, and I've watched you share really well when you needed to. So that's not my experience. I mean, I, I do understand about cultural differences and, and hear you, and and I do understand about, about um, uh, you know, various personality types, but I just want to, you know, say that my experience of you is that when you need to say something, you do. 
and it's usually something we all should listen to just a little feedback here in front of everyone um so <laughs> but probably culturally completely inappropriate so i apologize for that um <laughs> But, you know, your your vision of your inter that that's an important thing. Thank you for bringing that up. So because our internal experience of ourselves. Probably in important ways differs in the way others experience us. So it's good to get feedback and good feedback is really hard to come by. I don't care if somebody says, I like you, I don't like you, I like what you did, I don't like it, it was great. These are useless comments, really useless. I smile and I say, thank you. Or I say, if it's a negative thing, oh, well, I'm sorry, um, how can I make it better? And I just try to be as gracious as possible about it. But that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for someone who says, as I did when I went for distinguished engineer, they said, I don't see any technical stuff here. And I had to go back through all my emails and papers and produce all that stuff before I got, before I got in, before I was voted in uh, across that line, because I had to prove my technical abilities because I didn't bring those to the table. And that's great feedback that I was missing a piece of what I needed to, to focus on and, and work with. Um, you know, that kind of feedback is golden. The feedback that I got from my, the other students was actually golden. I needed to learn some interpersonal skills and learn to let go of anything I didn't need to control. I needed to, to learn to, to have some boundaries and some respect for other people. And I spent the next oh, rest of my life working on that. Rosario. Hi, um, just want to understand uh, uh, on the topic of care to share. Uh, Brooke, could you uh, expand a little more what really you mean to share? Because I mean, we can take this question on, on this specific uh, concept principle uh, different ways. So, what what are we what are we talking when we say share? What are the things that come to you in mind when you talk about care to share? Could you give that examples? What what the share sure. that we were implying? Sure. So, uh, let's say I'm in a uh, I'm in a meeting. Oh, and I'm in a meeting and. People are, uh, we'll get to you in a moment, Yakub, I'll, I'll try to, unless you have an answer to this, um, could let you go, but let me, let me take a shot at it, okay? Uh, um, I'm in a meeting and people are going down a rat hole that isn't going to really solve the problem because, well, no, this isn't a good example, but it's something I do all the time where I'll just stop us and say, wait a minute, we don't have all the information. Can we get the information? It's not a good example. Um, let's say uh, somebody's struggling and they came to, they come to me and this happens all the time when I'm leading a security architecture practice. This happens all the time. People who are newbies to threat modeling will typically start with um, Microsoft's threat modeling tool, TMT, as we call it in the industry. They'll start there because it's free and it produces a lot of results and it's really easy to use. You just draw your trust boundaries and your flows and your major components and boom, you get a whole long list of laundry list of stuff you might look at. Okay, it's a great beginning, but invariably when people do this, they get those, three, those 14 pages and they say, do we have to do all this, Brooke? Can you help me? And I could just say, you know, figure out what's the most prior, what's the priority things that you really need to do. I could just do that. But instead, I will always say, let's meet and let, let's go over it because there's gold in there, but there's a lot of dross and we need to have some sense of priority and we need to have some sense of risk rating so we need to understand things. And I start working through the results with them 
all the time being encouraging, but saying, look at these results, look at those results. Yeah, look at this thing. The, you know, this doesn't happen very often and it's kind of out of context of what we're talking about here. So do we need to do that? Let's find the really important things. And I help them find those. And their ability to do threat modeling increases dramatically because they tried, they had some problems, and now they've had some help learning some new and useful techniques. That's what I mean. That's one example of sharing, but it doesn't have to be that. It could just be, you know, I, I tried this this way and I actually did it this way and it actually worked for me. So, um, you know, maybe we should try it this other way, but you're free to try it the other way. Maybe I just didn't do it well. You know, that's sharing too. Um, giving people their agency, but at the same time, sharing your experience. Um, it could be that. Um, we had one principal engineer who did not mentor people in the classic sense of the word. But this person really, anytime anybody was in trouble in his deep area of expertise, he would always be there for their technical needs. And, and was, you know, recognized as the person to go to when people were struggling. And he was always helpful. Um, and uh, that's a different kind of sharing, right? And, and maybe, you know, and, and another kind, of course, is doing this kind of a presentation. And, you know, if you can do it, um, Sung knows that, that I'm very practiced at this. And my natural being is to not uh, is to not get up on stages. I'm incredibly frightened unless I have a guitar between me and the audience. Um, and so, uh, you know, I've had to learn how to do this and be comfortable and settle myself down because I care so much. This goes back to the taking responsibility. I care so much about what we're doing here that I want to help if I possibly can. Um, Yaku raised his hand and Denise raised his hand. Um, who wants to go first? Yeah, I'll, I'll just quickly jump on the previous topic of balancing care to share with cultural background. Um, well, I, I also have some personal experiences with that. Uh, when I moved from Poland to Australia, um, the, the Polish way of expressing ourselves is to be really honest, sometimes even blunt. So, yeah, and it this cultural background, uh, it, it works sometimes if you're in, in your advantage, sometimes not. So when you talk about business, yes, it allowed me, for example, to introduce some changes in the company because I just, I was able to say, hey, this doesn't work. We need to change it. But on a personal level, <laughs> it was terrible. I mean, uh, the communicate uh, was like being too honest was not working in my advantage. Uh, the, the, the Australians prefer much nicer communicates. Uh, so that's it. So I think you just need to adjust it to the current culture, not, not in a country, but in a company. If the company is all, all good with sharing your previous um, experience and your knowledge, then yeah, I mean, you've got this experience, so we need to use it. It, it works to the advantage of the whole company. But I want to remind us that uh, are, are usually most organizations are not therapy sessions. So there's, there's a sense of boundaries here too. You know, um, a little vulnerability can really go a long way and too much or being the funny person, I sometimes step over the line and it's not funny and uh, it's very embarrassing. Um, and I apologize uh, up front, but a little humor really can help too. So there are all these techniques and we also have to be aware of, of, of cultural differences to Sung and Jakob's um, point. There are really strong cultural differences. One of the things I love about Polish people and Germans and Israelis is they tell you right up front what they're thinking. And they expect that there will be conflict. And that doesn't mean I don't like you. It just means we disagree. And it's very upfront. But just try that in California sometime. Uh, it doesn't go over very well. Um, Californians require three to four thank yous 
for borrowing a pencil. Yes, they do. And several <laughs> pleases. They do. And the way that, I mean, I have literally sat in meetings for six weeks when one director says what they want and then the other director says what they want and they clearly are in conflict, but each meeting they go through the same dance. And finally, again, feeling fairly confident that I can find a job somewhere, uh, which takes away a lot of fear. Um, I finally said, you know, you guys don't agree. Can we just, you know, deal with the conflict as opposed to hearing your positions again over and over and over again because it's been six weeks and you know i've heard all this already oh you could have sucked lemons in that room but we got to the problem then um so you know sometimes it's like that go ahead denise please oh sorry yeah the thing i just want to say on this one is that um, first of all, I think there's, there's two interesting parts here, right? The first one is cultural, where culture is a massive thing, right? And, and culture is a massive thing in communicating, like you just some of the examples you said, but also you, you get this very interesting situation when you build diverse teams, which is by definition, they are diverse. So by definition, you're, if you build a leadership team that is diverse, which you know is the best one to get, but now you have, you know, literally your your right side can be, you know, driving your left side of the team completely insane, right? Because <laughs> because they are diverse, right? So it, that it's was true. Really that was an interesting thing that I, I, I kind of I've learned also the, you know, the hard way, which is like you, you build a nice team that has the ones that accelerate a lot and the ones that are very thoughtful and the ones that improvise and the ones that, you know, are very methodical. And then you need to start adjusting. Right. So the key point here is communicating. Right. It, you know, is very cultural, but is also very related to the team. But the other thing, just going to the care to share is that what I've learned was that sharing is very hard. Now, I happen to be somebody that I've learned to share as a strategy, but even I sometimes feel a little bit the pressure of, of what happens when you share. And, I, and I, when I reverse engineered it, it's because every time you share, you put yourself at risk, right? You know, and that's a very interesting situation, right? Like, because it's easy not to share. It's easy to, st to basically, in a way, if you think about it, like, you know, um, uh, what's it called? Sung's comment is very is is a very great example because you know from her, in her mind she's going to think it may be either explicitly or just by instinct. If I share this, there's a possibility they can backfire. If I don't share this, then at least I don't have that problem, right? And I you know and and it's sometimes it's easy to make the the logic to say well it's safer not to share, right? And, and, what, and what I've learned was that sharing is hard. Sharing is a, a tool, like for example, you already mentioned that you learn to share. You learn to share, but more importantly, I think, and I think, I think the same happened to me, is that I've learned that there is so much good things that happen when you share that it's worth the couple of times that it backfires. And, and you, this is a really important point here, Denise. That is, when you open, it will bear on you. There is that possibility. So I like to run a very, as, as generous and open and connecting, um, a, what I call radical support as well. What's the best for you? It may not be the best for me, but I'm, I'm trying to be there and the best for us all. It, best for you can't be against the, the general, the group, the collective good, but as long as it fits within it, I'm, I'm, I'm there in a radical support for you. On the other hand, that backfires sometimes. Not everybody is playing with an integrity deck. Not everyone is doing that. Yeah, and, but, and you have to understand that, especially in these large organizations, even a large organization of a few hundred. But, um, you know, you take something like uh, an Intel or a Cisco with 120,000 people on their network every day, that there are going to be people there who aren't playing by the same values that I'm playing. Absolutely. And so they will misuse you. So I have a strategy when I share, and I do a lot of sharing, especially sometimes um things 
are public, right? And, and also, I, I, I always like to think that I'm sharing for my future self. And I have so many examples where things that I share, especially publicly, I get to use in the future, which would, I would have lost if I hadn't shared. But my strategy mm -hmm. for sharing is that there's, there, there's three steps on this, is that when you share, right, in the first hour is when it can backfire spectacularly. That's probably the time you think from a, from a firing point of view, that is the worst situation because it's, it's the moment that you're most exposed, right? Because you shared and you hadn't had any peer review, right? So what, what I do when I share, I, I immediately share my sharing, right? So I make sure that I'm not the only one who, you know, basically, you know, I, I, I put something, I tweet about it, or I share internally, hey, I just post this. Because what's interesting is after an hour, the people that you told now have responsibility. So they have a day to come back and saying, what happened? Why you've done this? What situation? After a day, they are as much accomplice with the sharing as you are. <laughs> because you can't come a week later going, why, why did you do this? Why did you share this? Why are you doing this? What's the situation, et cetera, if they knew about it, right? So, and the good news is if you do this a lot, you have a couple of, you know, almost like, points to use right you have a couple of vouchers that you can use because if you share normally you can just go oh okay i got that one wrong right but if you never share then it's a big thing so there's there's value in um in oversharing but you i i, I had to learn and i had to find techniques and i think that the key part is you have to in your head you have to have a very you have to make that calculation that there's a risk but there's a much bigger benefit of it and then know that when you have a pushback accept it as all right you know you know not everything i shared should be shared from a from an organization point of view you you know you're only going to get 90 percent right so and it helps if you share a lot because then it's not like the one you shared that backfired thank you denise yes um no comment just fantastic stuff um Let's move on. Actually, so if I can, one thing you can't do to 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 sing. The other thing I, I've learned, right, the hard way, or maybe the good way, right, is that I don't control how others interpret my actions. And and actually, going back to your initial example, Brooke, when you said you, you told somebody, now I this is how I eat my banana, and they interpret, right? Um, don't eat bananas, right? I had so many cases where. What I said, and I, I you know, in my head, I, I know exactly what I said, they were very interpreted differently. I've learned that you don't control how others interpret. And this is even without getting politics, right? So as long as you're doing the right thing in your heart, for example, Sung, right? As long as you feel that you're being fair with you and the business and your environment, you know, you don't control how others or that small percentage that might always, you know, have an issue with something, right? So you might as well share. Well, so I just, again, I loved working with you in town. It was such a uh, I'm so in network. Um, one thing is, I, uh, uh, the port, I, time, uh, she used to say, step over the dirty clothes because it's not my job. And that's not leadership. You have to take responsibility. At Intel, they used to say, you own it until you give it away. Um, that's a little extreme, but still, it, it does speak to a piece of leadership, which is there are dirty clothes here. I can at least put them in the, in the laundry basket, even if I can't do them right now you know, that, that to, to this kind of ownership and seeing problems and trying to think about what, what might make things better. Um, in 2002, uh, I think circa 2002, maybe it was late 2001, I really don't remember, but uh, John Stewart took over for Cisco InfoSec. And he asked his most senior person, Michelle Gell, who was you, you may know in the history books as Michelle Crabb. She was the person who dealt with the Morris worm at NASA. Um, so she'd been at this a long time. He asked Michelle Gell to 
start modeling and shifting the way we were working because the dis the infosec that i joined in 2000 was literally the most dysfunctional environment i have ever been in and i thought i knew from dysfunction because we had a we had someone who who would routinely make deals at a little my you know one of my first roles um would routinely make deals and then go into the meeting to report back and say, I didn't say any of that, you know, really dysfunctional. So I thought I knew dysfunction and I'd spent a whole lot of years in a company that really had pretty good process around stuff. Um, and then I got to Cisco and it was crazy. People were backbiting. There were political wars on the joke list constantly. Um, people were really mean to each other. Uh, there were little cliques. Um, it was it was pretty bad. And they had a change of management. A few people who were really destructive left because there was the dot com bust. And and so they decided they did their first riff, which is get rid of your 10 percent. And we, we had to fire four. One of those folks was a manager who had and I'll just tell you this. This is absolutely true. He used to say quite edgy. My, it's, I hesitate to say racist because he was a black man, but um, very uh, pointedly about race and, and about, about women, specs especially in his meetings and his team were in revolt. And he had the male multiple orgasm book on the edge of his desk pointed at the person who was sitting on the other side. Um, so he got canned. Uh, Sorry, Brooke, you, you do realize that we're recording this, right? Yes. Well, I haven't named anybody. Okay, um, cool. Just I haven't second. named anybody. Right. Um, I haven't named anybody, and I don't ever. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have said the, you know, the whole thing there. Maybe you're right. Um, but nevertheless, uh, just to tell you how dysfunctional it was, it was awful. And the entire team were in revolt. Well, John Stewart came in, and he asked Michelle Gell, he said, how can we turn this around? And I, I want to talk a little bit about taking leadership when you're not the designated person. Because I have a bunch of skills that I learned elsewhere around group process and facilitation and negotiation and, um, and compromise and, and such like and interpersonal um, interchange. I simply started modeling and doing those and expecting those from the people around me um, in support of Michelle's work. And you don't have to be the designated leader. It was amazing. Michelle and I are very, very, very close friends today. Um, I have the absolute deepest respect for her um, and, and John as well. And we turned that, uh, you know, I'm going to take a little credit here, Michelle's leadership, absolutely. Um, but I lent my support completely. And wherever I could, I modeled the behaviors that I wanted us to have. And I modeled the behaviors that we had agreed upon that Michelle wanted us to have. And in this way, that's a kind of leadership that doesn't need anything. You can lead from the side. I learned this years and years ago as an, as an anti-nuclear activist. You don't have to be the facilitator in order to lead. You don't have to be the designated person. You can provide leadership from any position if you see it needs to happen and you, 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 you can exhibit some of the caring and some of the responsibility that we've been talking about. Um, it, you don't need to. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I, wanna, I wanna point out that InfoSec was an entirely different group in a year and a half, an entirely different group with a lot of the same people, by the way, um, who didn't like being there before, but they, they it was incredibly turned around. A lot of that has to do with Michelle, of course, and John, but it has to do with everybody stepping up and everyone who could showing how we could behave with each other and how we could be. And that shifted everything. It really shifted everything. It was, uh, it was uh, really, really powerful to watch that ship turn around. When I left there, it was one of, I mean, if they hadn't 
handed me a whole bunch of money to, to retire, retire, which I didn't do. I just took another job. But if they hadn't handed me a bunch of money, I would never have left. I loved working with that team. They were so fantastic. They are so fantastic. Um, and I have many friends still there. Um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, it can show how leadership can uh, play out. And you, know, you can go from really terrible with people in basically mutiny to people being so effective and so amazing with each other and building so many great things. Um, fantastic turnaround. And yeah, I want to credit John and Michelle. Absolutely. Um, also, my dear friend, Vinay Bansal, um, who, you know, came in and, and demonstrated a lot of leadership. People like, and I'll just name a couple of other really fantastic people like Marty Nystrom. Um, really amazing, amazing people. And, and just uh, Carolyn Thrasher just completely shifted that reality to a group I didn't want to leave. They were so fantastic. So little story. Does it take charisma? I mean, I worry about this because I'm not very charismatic, I think. Um, and I, and I, let me let me put that in, in perspective. I'm touring with Bo Diddley. Yes, I have had a whole musical life um, outside of high tech. And I'm touring. I'm a young man. I think I was 21 or 22. I'm touring with this big star. And the band is playing before he comes on. And there's 5,000 people out there. And they're, you know, they're sort of grooving on the music. It's really good. And they're talking to each other. And, and it's a great little party scene. And Bo comes on stage. And within 10 seconds, every eye in that audience is glued to that man. Every eye. Now, I'll tell you, Bo Diddley personally was, in my estimation, a really lovely and caring being. And I loved getting to know him. And I loved, I loved working with him. But I just want to say, charisma, there's something about the way that man could hold a stage that people could not resist paying attention to the simplest dump to dump to dump, dump a dump, dump. I'm a man. And immediately, everybody's glued to him just glued to him. Um, no announcement, nothing. He came up while we were still playing. Um, you know, he just walked on stage and people are glued. Now that's charisma, in my opinion. That's presence. Um, I don't have it. I really don't. And it's okay. I don't think we really need that. And I, I don't go down that path too far because what, if it's something sort of indefinable, then, you know, maybe I can develop better skills than I have. Um, I used to walk around like this when I got on stage and I would talk like this because I was really scared. And I learned to sit up straight, stand up straight, look the audience in the eye, speak a little slower, think about what I'm saying, know what I'm going to say. You know, there's a lot of practice here. And, and maybe that makes me easier to digest and understand. But, you know, I'm not Daniel Craig and I'm not Bo Diddley and that's okay. Um, so I don't get too wrapped up around this stuff because it doesn't do me any good. If it's something you either have or you don't, then, you know, it's nothing I can do about it. I can have better skills and that helps. Um, I think I went over all these things. I do want to say something and it's something you said, Denise, that is so important, and that's inclusion. And I think it speaks a little bit to what Sung was offering as well. Um, I want to make a place where everyone's contribution is valuable. And there's a huge body of research by now. It had just been started when I first did my first like um, consensus training at a bank in, what was it, 1982, I think? Um, but, uh, nevertheless, uh, there's a huge, there was a little research on this then, but now there's a huge body of research that a team of diverse thought and approaches where everyone is, uh, everyone's contribution is valued will consistently and provably and measurably outperform the smartest guys I'm using that on purpose, guys in the room every time. And that's really important 
because just to be effective, we want to be inclusive and value. But it it's also much nicer to be there, right? It's it's great to to want to be someplace and feel like you have some agency in the work. I think uh, Luis talked about that. Um, and and have agency over the work. Uh, that's very important. Just, you know, go read the, the Agile Manifesto again. Um, and, uh, but inclusion, really important because I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting in a threat modeling session and the lead architect is drawing away on the board, telling us how things go. And another person says, wait a minute, that's not what we implemented. That's not how it works. And you go down a rabbit hole and it wasted work if we hadn't been inclusive. So inclusion is really, really, really provably valuable. And you can go out and look at the research on this. There's a lot of it now. Um, so I'm not gonna cite it here. Um, I think it's good to be a little vulnerable. It's good to talk a little bit about one's personal stuff. And it's good to say, I mean, that's my style, I'll just say, and other people may not be comfortable with that. But I think it's really important for me to be a whole person within limits. Again, work is not a therapy session and it should never get to be a therapy session. One of the things I have observed in a dysfunctional group were two people who'd become lovers in the group having very loud arguments personal arguments regularly on, you know, in the office, not good, not good at all. Um, but uh, a little vulnerability, a little bit, this is me. And how about you? I think, you know, it's, it, it can help if you can do that. Again, that's a stylistic thing. I think very important to listen, to understand. What I have to say is probably about, about as important as my ability to really listen carefully and understand what other people are saying. Because sometimes I don't have the right answer and sometimes I make mistakes and miss stuff. I was doing a threat model for a client not too, a couple of years ago and I almost got to finish the report and realized I hadn't gone over the password storage for the management interface. Oops, ouch. Ooh. Really bad. Luckily, I caught it before we did the report. And luckily, I checked it out. I was really embarrassed to go be asking that question so late in the game. But nevertheless, it didn't get left on the floor, thankfully. However, pretty big miss. Could have been really horrible. So, you know. Um, and then I work with a lot of humility. Um, your, your presentation may be different. And that, by the way, is me going up a hill to ski down it in Yellowstone in the middle of the winter. But I thought, you know, all these grand trees and I'm very, very small in this grand, you know, keeping my right size. And the most important, five most important words, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I think that's so important to be able to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong because I will, there will be conflict and I will mismanage it from time to time. I know this about me. And uh, I just have to take my heart in my hand and say, you know, I blew it. And how can I make this better? How can we go forward? And so I think for me, it's one of my biggest tools. I like to say that my ego is probably my least valuable possession. So one of my tricks, and it really is a trick, and I, I, say, I say this with all knowledge that sometimes I'm manipulating things, sometimes I do, um, is when there's a big kerfluffle, when there's something that's gone wrong, if it's on my watch, I just go in and say, it's my fault, period. It's my fault. I, for one thing, I want to cut the blame storming down because we can't solution as long as we're sitting there trying to figure out who did this. It doesn't really help. So I just say, it's my fault. Now, two things result from that. The people who are playing fair will say, oh, yes, but we did this and, the, you know, we did that and, and start sharing in responsibility. And you build trust. You build a lot of trust. 
that you can work through stuff. And the once in a while person who's not actually playing for the team will say, yes, it is your fault. And now I know about them. I've smoked them out and I can work around them. And I need to know who those people are. I desperately need to know who those people are because I can't do my job well if I don't smoke them out. So it's kind of a twofold little thing trick that I do. But, you know, it, you have to let go of your ego and say, yeah, I don't care if people are mad at me. I mean, I do care if people are mad at me, uh, especially when it's real. But yeah, I'm not going to let that stop me from getting the work done, I think is more the, the thing. And believe my, my heart, my stomach is in my mouth when I do this. Believe me, uh, it's not easy. I'm not saying it's emotionally easy, but I want to have the courage to say, it's my fault. How do we move forward? It's something that I do. Um, I think the Intel um, principal engineer qualifications are actually, it's their distinguished engineer equivalent, um, is, is pretty good. You got to have technical excellence and depth. That really helps because that's earned authority. You got to help other people, however you do that. Again, there's no map there. Um, there are a lot of different ways to do that. And you got to take responsibility and then execute on it and show that. And there's something tremendously attractive about that that brings you people to help, I find. Um, there's nothing like something going forward to bring people to you. But don't, you know, I think, I, I do know leaders who are don't have much technical depth, but they're very, very smart, smart. Um, and they acknowledge that right away and say, I'm counting on you to help me understand. So there's a way to thread that, that, that works. And I know a couple of leaders who are fabulous, um, who, who can do that, uh, you know, and they're just very humble about what they know. My friend, Ryan Tabloff likes to say, I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. Now, the thing is, I experienced Ryan as being amazingly smart. <laughs> but there's a certain, you know, uh, humility that that he's expressing about, yeah, I want to learn. I want people who are really sharp around me that that teach me good things and help me understand. Um, and that, you know, that's also a kind of leadership, I think. I have some tricks. I facilitate much more than direct. I already said that. A lot of pro-social modeling, um, which is very hard for me because I come from a real hard scrabble. Um, uh, childhood and also um, it may not be totally obvious but it was obvious to a few people the few people who were really really racist when I was a child I'm, I'm Native American and they knew that and they made my life absolutely miserable as a child going through school um, because I wasn't um, white enough for them um, and so you know I come from kind of a hard scrabble background so this stuff doesn't come easily to me um, but I keep working on it um, and I keep, I keep in there because it's really important that we treat each other well. Uh, I cheerlead a lot. Again, radical support. A lot of active listening. As I said, I really prefer asking over commands. Um, you know, and I try to do what's needed, even, you know, even if it's just wiping down the break room sink because it's dirty. Uh, whatever needs to happen you know um oh that's a good story dale dale sekajima who was the ceo of this software house i was at for almost 12 years um he was the ceo for a lot of that time and one time he was putting up some bookshelves and i said dale you're the ceo why are you doing this work and he looked at me and he said because i'm the ceo and i'm making space for you to do the work we really need and i just love that about Dale, and I love that about the way he led with this kind of quiet, um, there's, you know, there's just work to be done. And if you need to do other things, I'm gonna make the work that do the things that make it possible for you to do what we need to do in order to make money and, and, and be good with our customers and deliver our products. And, and I just love that about Dale. He also taught me how to fly fish. Um, not that that's particularly important, but he did. He, 
he was very kind and taught me how to fly fish, which I desperately wanted to learn how to do since I was like 11 years old. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's it. These are my tricks. This is my thing. Does anybody want to say anything? Um, anybody have anything to add to all of this? Please. I'm good. Really great stuff. Anybody Thank else want to? Please. Now, I just said thank you, and I wrote in the chat, I don't know if you saw it, but, you know, because of this conversation, I commit myself to share <laughs> uh, by oh. giving a talk at a conference. Oh, well, if you want, if you want anything from me, like I said, a lot of my conference um, speaking skills are really hard won. I actually talked to a bunch of theater people about the way I was holding my body and the way I was speaking because I really don't have any skills with that. Um, I'm used to standing, if I'm in front of an audience, I'm used to standing with a guitar and expressing it through that. You know, um, This was a entirely new, new for me. So if you want some help or anybody wants some help in this regard, I show you what I know. Um, there are things that theater people know that, that I don't know or didn't know and that, that can really help. Um, and uh, you know, I, I offer my support for you as always. And look, uh, and Sung, if you if you're looking for a, a nice, very light pressure place to present your research, um, you know the Open Security Summit would more than welcome your presentation. <laughs> Thank you. And by the way, the, the, the way I've um, got into doing research is I I eventually got to the point where I would submit to a to a present to a, an event what I want to learn, and then get it approved, then have the pressure to deliver it at, um, you know, at the event. I do the same. Well, I, I have to say one of my, I, I, you know, one of my favorite moments on that one was I was, I was doing a, a DEF CON presentation with Abe. If you, uh, uh, if you guys want to see, it's a pretty cool one on the spring MVC vulnerabilities and, and a bunch of other things. And, uh, and I remember arriving at, uh, you know, DEF CON, so Black Hat and DEF CON, right? And I meet him on the Tuesday or something like that. And he was like, cool, let's let's guess review the presentation, right? And um, and let's finalize everything, right? And I was like, what do you mean, man? I haven't done my research, right? I, I still have like, I still have four days. Right? <laughs> I didn't know that about you. So uh, it's important. Um, we were both speaking, Denise and I met when uh, we were both speaking at uh, one of SANS What Works Summits, probably 2007 or 2008, oh, I think that it was. Goes a while back. Yeah, that was a while back, Denise. And uh, and Denise got on the stage and absolutely was riveting. I felt like such a newbie uh, watching you do your thing on that stage. I just want to tell you. Um, so even by that point, you were you were pretty good on the stage, at least in my opinion, for what it's worth. Just riveting, sharp, funny. Um, I wish I were funnier on stage, but I am just not. A comedian. There's nothing um, like writing the slides on the way to the presentation. <laughs> There's actually then a number we, of people I think here who I've seen me do that, right? Like I, I actually gone to events where I go, can I go last? Because I still need another half an hour to finish my slides. <laughs> well, I was screwing around with this deck just before we just before we got on the call. So just you know, um <laughs> caught then, then as it were. You know, the key thing is that the more you do it, the easier it becomes, right? And and again, like the more you you accept, you know, it's an interesting way because because I also found this way that you you have to accept failure, right? You have to accept that you're not going to get all of them right. So actually, if if that actually makes you more confident, because you you know in a way you then don't worry so much about the problem. So when when stuff happens, you go, well, you know, you could have gone so much worse, right? then yeah that, well that's, that's true like, that's like if that's the one that got me in trouble that, <laughs> that <laughs> well lot, that's right? what john stewart i once asked him i said why did you take over this crazy dysfunctional team and i hope i'm not revealing too much but he said he said oh, i couldn't have gotten worse i could only go up 
<laughs> and, you know, <laughs> and look where he is today. I mean, John is just so fantastic. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the, it's the way you got to be yeah. not afraid. And, and so what I do is before I get on stage or for this, I always say, I am not important here. If I mungle my words or forget something or, or forget to say something or, or you know, get lost, um, it, that's not really important. What's important is that something in this work helps just one person in that audience. I've been effective. Yeah. I've achieved my goal. If just, if I've helped, because what we do this is half the stuff, this leadership, but what we do technically and personally, it's hard. I just want to say that it's complex. It may not always be hard, but it certainly is complex. It's, it's a big puzzle. And we're, you know, to, to, to think you're going to get out of it without making mistakes, A, and to think that, that, you know, everybody else knows what you know. No, they don't. They really don't. We really all need to hear from each other desperately, which is one of the things I love about the Open Security Summit. Because, you know, if I were doing this RSAC, I would not any way be able to have you all chime in. They just can't do that that way. They can do labs that way. And I have done them that way um, at RSAC. But the presentations, they're really the format is you get on stage. It's, you know, you're the talking head and then you take questions. And the questions are pretty carefully managed. Um, and it's really different to be here where we're all equals and peers and pouring into our common knowledge because this stuff is hard. And, and I don't want to diminish the difficulty of what we face, which I talked about on Tuesday, which is we're adding to our huge pile of software and it's full of vulnerabilities and we don't know which ones. We don't have a good way right now, really fast operational way to find the ones that are really important and, and, and mitigate them. And that is pretty big set of problems. So, Sang just made a really great comment, right? She talks about sometimes you think that what you have is trivial. Sang, what you have is called the curse of knowledge, right? And, and actually it, it's, it's worth understanding it because it's, it's sometimes it also allows, you know, one to have a mental model about why, why you're not understood. Right or why you know you think something is trivial but others not right? Look, the, the the bottom line of you know if you find that the stuff that you think is trivial you know is still news to others and it's kind of like interesting and, and like Brooke was saying, as long as there's one, one person in the audience. Look, I've done presentations that I know that half the crowd thought I was the, the most insane person in the planet, right? But there's people in the crowd that actually got a lot out of it, and that for me, and I got a lot out of it. So you know, I, I think it's 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 good. Right, because you know, some people will only understand some bits, but also sometimes you know, the curse of knowledge is very real because what you think is trivial is trivial because you have mental models because you've done the paradigm shifts. Right, if somebody has done the paradigm shifts, explaining how you've done your paradigm shifts actually helps a lot. I just want to say one final thing before we finish big shout out to Franklin for the book that she wrote called Insecurity. I don't know if you guys read that book. It's a really great book, and he also taught me a lot, but he especially talks about the whole imposter syndrome, which we talked a little bit about on this, on, on this session, right? Which is very real. And, it's, and it's, there's a lot of great examples of how to identify it, how to, to deal with it. And, and, and I think it's a, it's a great one that talks about, you know, some of the stuff that we talked about here. You know, Jane is a very big proponent of trying to find leaders, especially, you know, on more diverse and, and non, white male sort of dominated technology right which is still a big problem uh Jakub wants to go yeah well a quick comment on uh what i've learned is the more trivial the presentation the bigger audience you have if you if you really spe specialized uh, talk on some very niche technology you will have 15 people in a room and maybe five will understand it and one will, you know, reach out to you. And then if you have more trivial topic at the very start, then yeah, you can have hundreds of people in a room. So don't worry about that. Yeah, business. And there's our fascination with the deep technical, uh, often to the detriment of 
of other things. And don't get me wrong, um, I'm super in need of security researchers. I said this on Tuesday, they're the ones, they're our, our comment committee on our designs at this point. And it's, it's really important as a defender, as a designer, it's really important that I have critical comment on my designs that says, yeah, you got this wrong, or look what this, did you think about this? That's so important. Um, at the same time, for the last 20 years, we've been down a rat hole that says, the more squirrely I can do something, what, uh, and I forget his name, um, uh, He's the guy, not Charlie Miller, but the other fella who did the, the big G pack in 2015. Um, great guy. Um, I can't think of his name right now, but he likes to call them stunt hacks, <laughs> which I think is, is really interesting because they're, you know, what we see on stage sometimes is uh, it's, it's amazing, but on the other hand, it's the condition, the preconditions are artificial or the person has a huge amount of um, access already. And if an attacker had all that access, they wouldn't bother doing the exploit. Um, so, you know, uh, it's just something to be aware of. And, and, and I like to watch myself because I can get down there in the bits and bytes too. <laughs> you know, it's, it's something we have to watch. What's, what's the, the big book that really changed my practice as a security practitioner from COP to security person was Secrets and Lies. And it's an old book. I think we're talking um, 2001 by Bruce Nyer. Right? <laughs> yeah, but that 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 book, and I don't know Bruce at all. Um, yeah. We've never met. So, um, um, Brooke, you can continue. But, I'm going to make your host, but on, on the topic of family and balance, I'm actually going for dinner now with my family. But you guys can continue. I'm making you a host so you can stop the recording if you guys want to continue for a bit longer. So, well, well, if we want to quit, that's okay too. Um, what do we want to do? We lost a bunch of people. I mean, I'm showing slides, so I can't see who's in the room anymore. Yeah. Let me uh, let me end the show. You don't need to see a picture of me. Um, but uh, yeah, let me.